Uh, thank you. I'll just give um, a short introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Suryani Sanjay Alias. Uh, I'm Malaysian. Um, just to give a context to today's presentation, um, one year ago, I was appointed to be the chairperson of the National Handicraft Development Corporation of Malaysia, which is a government agency created by uh, legislation, the um, Handicraft Act, so we're subjected to parliament. Uh, so we're a statutory agency that has been entrusted to promote and market uh, crafts and, um, and help our artisans. Um, so that's uh, the context of today. So um, I think it was really uh, fantastic to listen to Adi because uh, I feel that he has given a lot of foundation for my talk <laughs> because uh, craft, uh, I think according to um, <clears throat> what Adi has presented, how uh, he feels that craft should not become industry but craft should collaborate with industry. Um, and uh, with Karina, it's more of a very micro level on what the weavers actually feel, the craftsperson actually feels, and uh, craft is a calling, it's not necessarily an occupation. So I wanted to start and begin uh, with craft as a spirit, as a calling, uh, because in my um, engagement and conversation with most cross people in Malaysia, I always ask them, why are you a cross person? Because Malaysia has a very diverse uh, economy and occupation, and I will ask them, why are you doing this? Why are you still carving uh, Chris? Or why are you weaving? Or why are you um, creating something out of silver that takes, you know, um, um, three weeks, uh, but you may not necessarily sell it. Um, and they always say that it's a calling. I want to do it because it makes me happy. So um, I'm going to start with a 30-second um, piece on our Adi Guru. We call our master artisans Adi Guru. Who's, it's like a teacher. They're like a teacher. So it's actually a title that the Kraftangan Malaysia, which is the um, agency that I uh, work with, um, given to artisans who have exceptional skill um, and um, who have originality in their work um, and who is able to teach to the younger generations. So when they get the title Adi Guru from Kraftangan Malaysia, they usually will get a stipend. Uh, for two years, they get a monthly uh, salary so that they're able to teach as well as to make. Um, and they also get a lump sum uh, uh, so that it it's kind of an at least a small you know token uh, symbolic appreciation of uh, who they are um, and then amongst this adi guru we have we select uh, toko craft nagara which means you're a national craft icon there's only six uh, and they're selected from Adi Guru. So far, we only have about 56 Adi Guru. Only 33 are live. We're actually documenting um, all the Adi Gurus. Uh, we're in the midst of doing that. That's one of the things when I first started with the national agency, I realized that there's a lack of uh, documentation uh, of our master artisans and um, their lives and their stories and to as an inspiration. So this is uh, the beginning of our um, effort uh, to bring craft to the people and also so that people in, in a language of creativity. So, um, <clears throat> and that, that's why I wanted to start with, uh, um, I wanted to talk about how craft and the creative industry in Malaysia is somehow separated. And I think that is to the detriment of craft, actually. And again, uh, if we talk about the, uh, um, the, the definition of industry here, uh, when I talk about the creative industry, I will explain later what I mean about the creative industry. And I'm not talking about industry in terms of 
mass production industry, but the creative industry as in like a group of um, areas which are defined as the creative industry, like fashion, contemporary art, uh, music, publishing, um, product interior graphic design. So in the context of creative industry, I think it's really important uh, that craft is part of uh, this ecosystem in order for it to survive and in order for it to be sustainable. And so that's my, my, my talk is about mainly my experience so far as the national agency in terms of direction we want to go uh, on how we're trying uh, in using different languages of the creative industry to make uh, craft very much part of it. Yeah. So, uh, Kraftangan, just quickly, Kraftangan Malaysia, uh, created in 1974. We have about 700 staff all over the country um, with about USD 12 million budget uh, every year. Um, we have a retail arm, which means that we have a national craft store um, in a few states and the flagship store is in Kuala Lumpur, right in the heart of Kuala Lumpur, near the KLCC, the Twin Towers. Um, and we have state branches of the agency almost in every state. But four major states in Malaysia, uh, Sabah, Sarawak in Borneo and Kelantan, Tengganu are the four states where most of the artisans come from. Uh, we also have a National Craft Institute, uh, which is the only craft academy in, I think, in, in Malaysia and perhaps the region. It only focuses on craft. We have 250 students um, and they do um, weaving, um, batik painting, um, uh, metal smithing, um, uh, weave, uh, ba basketry, as well as carpentry. And uh, at the end of it, they get a diploma that now can be uh, accredited so that they can go on to design university or architecture or whatever. It can, the credits can be transferred. So that's um, uh, one of the things that we're working on with British Council as well to strengthen the curriculum so that they are able to have many channels of occupation in the creative industry and uh, not necessarily uh, become a craftsman or craftswoman at the end of the day. So um, we have a KL Craft Museum that has about 4,000 archives of uh, uh, items that has been collected all these years in the last 40 years uh, of craft. Um, and we are under the Ministry of Tur Tourism, Culture, Arts and Heritage, which I will come to. And it has become an issue to be under the Ministry of Tourism for craft. Uh, and I will get to that next. Oh, sorry. So just a snapshot, the um, Malaysian craft industry, uh, roughly based on revenues, it's about uh, USD 170 million annual revenue. Um, and we have registered with us so far about 11,296 uh, craft workers, um, 5,800 craft businesses, uh, and then we have 56 master artisans and six national craft icons. So just a snapshot. But this is not um, necessarily an accurate whole picture because the, these are workers and craft businesses that are just registered with National Handicraft Development Corporation. Those who don't register, um, we won't necessarily know because we don't have the data. And our craft revenues mostly, um, as you can see, there's a big gap between the more industry type craft, which is design plus industry type craft, which is Royal Slango Pewter. Royal Slango Pewter is the big, probably the biggest craft company that has uh, managed to go global and they are a global brand. They, their, their revenue alone, it, they only have about 400 workers, I think, and their revenue alone is about 50 million US dollars a year. Uh, compared to 
the small businesses, the small artisan entrepreneurs or just artisan businesses under, registered under the National Handicraft Development Corporation. Um, the revenue is USD 120 million uh, a year, but those are like from 5,000 artisans. Yeah, whereas one company with 400 people <laughs> have 50 million uh, revenue each year because they have gone global. So these are, uh, and um, so these have, but they have been exist in existence since the 1900s. Yeah, so over 100 years, um, and it's a family business. So it's the, you know, probably the fourth generation already. Um, and they're very successful uh, with their modernization and contemporary take on pewter. Yeah, so, um, and generally, the top making products, the top artisanal products from Malaysia that sells, uh, that the higher sales is textile based. Uh, second is the forest based, which is rotan, bamboo, wood, etc. And then the third is uh, metal. Yeah, and the rest is uh, mixed uh, um, other things, yeah, other materials. So in terms of materials, the biggest uh, uh, revenue earner is textile based, and then the second is forest based, and the third is um, metal. So, but comparatively, when you talk about the Malaysian creative industry, it has been, there's, a, there's not much data, but so far the reported data from um, the UN Creative Economy Report um, is that the creative exports in Malaysia is worth about six billion US dollars so far. That's the creative exports only, yeah? Uh, and a lot of it come from design goods. But um, the Malaysian Creative uh, Industry Policy 2009, um, it hasn't moved for, well, 11 years. There has been a creative industry policy that included craft uh, in it. Uh, so it uh, included craft in the, under the creative industry policy, but... Um, the creative industries right now is divided between two ministries, and there is there lies the problem, the issues that come out with policy uh, and how it affects craft on a lower level, uh, and how the policy look at creative industry and craft almost separately rather than together. Even though in 2009 the creative industry policy included craft, but even in the UN report they have separated. Um, even though they include craft and creative industry, but they have separated it from design goods, for example. So craft and design is looked at separate. Uh, yeah, and even so, and craft looks is looked at as a lower value item than design, even though they they are craft design. That's why I'm interested in your uh, presentation because there's a category that I think people forget now to look at it in a more granular way. Uh, the definition of craft, how craft also uh, uh, has craft art craft and as well as design craft and there's conventional craft. So even though if we, I think that there's a gap in terms of also uh, data on craft and that's affecting policy at the detriment of craft. So uh, just quickly, so craft is not under the ministry that is in charge of creative industry. <laughs> so this is the creative industry as a whole. Um, but un in Malaysia, it's split into two ministries. So there's a very uh, f there's a focus on creative digital industry, which is has film, animation, visual effects, and then um, architecture, creative multimedia, advertising. It's all here. So it's quite high value, considered high value creative goods and services. And then there's the Ministry of Tourism, Art, Culture, and Heritage, where um, tourism, tourism, craft, fashion, visual art, performing arts, music, publishing, publishing museums, and galleries are all in one sector. So, sorry? Books, literature, 
literature. So it's like it's considered as if it's all like soft type of things, you know, and um, and cultural and heritage, and therefore not much economic value, but more of a, you know. Uh, symbolic national identity um, and and to make matters worse because it's in under the Ministry of Tourism it has become all subset to tourism so as a result the way you know policy is made it's become like you know craft fashion visual art performing arts have become have, have been looked through the lens of tourism now because tourism is the money making machine um, and under it is the things that support tourism so so it has affected uh, the way the government allocate resources and create policy yeah, yeah. so this is why it matters where <laughs> craft is uh, located which ministry uh, which policy and whether it should be again integrated into the creative industry like the policy in 2009 so this is the implication of how we structure the government and policy um, so the ministry in charge of creative industry policy is here but the rest of the creative industries are there so No, they don't talk to each other. They don't call. They don't. They didn't call each other for meetings. They, they, they compete for resources. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, the Ministry of Communications, with creative, digital, all the techie stuff, wins all the time now because it's looked as as the future, whereas culture and heritage is unfortunately looked at as the past. So there's a, you know, there's a disconnect. Right, and that's why, in at least in the Malaysian context, I don't know what's happening in other countries, but in the Malaysian context, this is what's happening. The split is affecting the craft, um, and the implications. Um, first, again, because craft is linked to tourism, it has become like a tourism merchandise. Craft is not art. It's not. Um, you know the spirit. It's not uh, calling. It's not art. It's it's not high value. But it has a lot of it has become um, in terms of perception. It's it's merchandise, and that's what the government agencies are are are, um, are uh, looking at when how they look at craft is it's merchandise, right? Um, and more and more in terms of policy and incentives and funding and grants, um, Malaysia, the way it behaves, and this is a subject of a paper that was done by two academics as well, the critique for the creative industry uh, policy 2009, uh, Malaysia has started treating creative industry as very a narrow definition. It's creative digital industry. So creative industry equals creative digital industry, which means like animation, visual effects, tech, creative multimedia, games are all creative industry, but not like craft, fashion, visual arts, which is very unusual. Uh, but it has become like that because of the series of, I think, steps and policy missteps. And um, again, like I said, Ang Angtad Creative Economy Report is also wrong, <laughs> I think, because they have only um, categorized craft uh, separately from design and other items, whereas, like, like you said, actually, it's much more than that, right? Because there's also now various categories of craft that can be uh, construed as art or um, as um, design goods. So why is it critical to locate craft under creative industry? The authenticity and provenance of the cultural creative economy, craft gives it character, depth and diversity. And for Malaysia, especially with a diverse um, uh, um, population with different cultures, different religion, different uh, ethnicities, uh, it's so important for craft to drive also to reflect this diversity in all of the creative industry, film, animation, design, etc. 
Um, and we have seen on the ground that when we integrate or collaborate, craft and different things, which I will show later in real experiences with the agency's initiatives, when you integrate uh, or collaborate, when craft collaborate, artisans collaborate with architecture, with designers, with graphic designers, with interior designers, mm, innovation happens. Creativity happens, um, and a lot of interesting, you know, interesting um, results uh, do come out, and it results also in high value, and it results in awareness of the m amazing skills that our artisans have, and the and the the um, possibilities that uh, are endless uh, for. Uh, creativity and innovation when you combine craft with other areas of the creative industry. The strategic positioning as the creative industry uh, is also important simply because then we get more resources from the government and agencies because once craft is part of the creative industry and it's looked as having economic value as well as social value, it becomes much more important. So. Um, at least from a policy perspective and from a government agency perspective, I think that you know it's very important to to um, have this conversation again. How craft is squarely under the creative industry is not separate, and it actually we should have a lot of cross disciplines uh, between craft and other disciplines in the creative industry because craft is an inspiration, it's a rich resource for the creative industry as well, and it's, it's very much part of it. So now I'll just go, like I said, when you mix, when you um, integrate craft into the creative industry, a lot of really good things happen. And plus, I think it it results in a stronger ecosystem for craft to survive. So how do we do this? Well, at least in the last one year, we have done a few things that we think is going in the right direction. I don't know yet how, how, um, how, how uh, impactful it's going to be. But so far, we're seeing interesting results when we bring architecture and craft together um, and uh, film and craft together um, and uh, contemporary art and craft together. And I'm just going to show you a few examples now before I end. So this was uh, Karaneka, the national retail store. And um, it's a very classic way of presenting crafts where you kind of mix, usually they mix everything based on type of craft. Textiles is all textile, metal is all metal, uh, baskets is all baskets. And so when people come in, you know, it's like it's almost as if they can't see how craft uh, can be a part of your everyday life because everything is based on. So and as well, there's no information, there's no storytelling. So we did a pilot project, the Karaneka Craft Store, the national flagship. We took over one section of it, got an, uh, we got um, an art and design, to re art and a designer to, to design the retail space. And um, also to do, we, we also wrote a story on craft. So the storytelling with the language of design um, transform one space. So we change the space into um, a different setup with each space curated as a different um, uh, focus. So one space is just for creative craft, curated um, selection of curated craft with high value. Another space is for everyday uh, crafts that you can use every day. And there you have like a dining table with, um, uh, with uh, plates, etc., to show people how you can live every day with craft. Um, whereas like the high value crafts is how we highlight the design and the designers and why they, why they design craft in a certain way and how they do it with the process. 
and we had instra Instagrammable corners where all the young people can come and you know do hashtag and Instagram everything. And we had a special section for Adiguru because we felt that a lot of people have forgotten, especially young people, they don't know who their Adigurus are. And by right, in especially in Malaysia, we don't we know we don't have masters of paintings, for example, like you know, centuries and centuries ago, but we do have master craftsmen um, because that's our culture. So these are like our Leonardo da Vinci. You know, like Italy has the Leonardo da Vinci, but these are our masters um, of, you know, for centuries, uh, including as early as second century, our craft culture has existed with the kingdoms uh, that were based in um, uh, Malaysia, yeah, like the Lankasuka kingdom, etc., etc., connected to Sri Vijaya. So we've had it for centuries. Um, and the craft, like metal and things like that, uh, copper, we've had it for centuries. So I wanted to educate, you know, the and remind people again, this is our culture. You know, uh, you know, Italy and whatever may have their, you know, uh, Leonardo, but we have our Adiguru. And so another Instagrammable, and this is also um, another um, innovation whereby um, someone in Sarawak, she took um, uh, fan covers, the fan, the standing portable fan, and she worked with longhouse communities to, to weave around the fan to create these um, items which have become baskets and trays uh, that people can reuse, so old. Um, it's, so it's actually recycled, uh, reusable fan covers that has now become really attractive uh, wall hangings or you can use it as fruit baskets. So that's craft and the language of design and how it can, you know, he, it can be translated into uh, using a different language in the creative industry. Um, craft and design can definitely um, uh, be belong together. And the next uh, example is craft and contemporary art on how when craft is presented as contemporary art, how the value suddenly can be much higher um, and how artists can work with artisans hand in hand and create an awareness on a particular craft. This is a village in Sabah um, that produces uh, this mat, a very colorful, attractive mats, and usually people buy it for about USD $100. When it went when it went into a shop, Karaneka shop, it became three hundred US dollars because of the way it's presented and because it's in a city. This is an artist Ilan, who's from Sabah, who worked with the artisans, um, and um, she exhibited the mat with her interpretation of what the mat should look like. As you can see, it's the same mat done by the same weavers, but she created um, furniture, pictures of furniture inside there because usually you do use the mat as furniture but to sit on. And then so she decided to put a table, etc., etc., and woven into the mat. And it has become an artwork. Um, she's represented by um, uh, a gallery in the Philippines, actually, called Silver Lens, and they presented her work uh, in art fairs as well as gallery. My time's up. So this is how it was presented in the art gallery, and the price is about USD $5,000 each. <laughs> and um, National, art, National Art Gallery Singapore saw it and decided, like, what a cool thing, because it's an artist who's working with community artisans. It has appeared in the National Gallery of Singapore right now as a mural. It's the same mat done by the weavers, and I think it's at least about 60,000 US. Um, yeah, and if you go to the National Gallery of Singapore right now, you see it there. So, you know, this is, and Ilan actually is still working with the weavers. She's supporting, she said, at least three villages who are weaving these mats. 
And recently, the mat has appeared as art in the cover magazine of Art Asia Pacific. So the mat has traveled through contemporary art um, very far. So that's another example of how you know, craft and the creative industry can actually work together and um, in changing perceptions of craft. And craft in architecture, I think this is probably the second last um, example that I'm gonna show. Um, we worked with an architect who presented a pavilion of um, woven, hand-woven mats in Hong Kong. Hand-woven mats are mostly done in the East Coast. It appeared in Hong Kong Design Biennale with an intervention of architecture. So it became, a, not only that, um, it was he used the actual hand-woven mats to create this pavilion um, in the Biennale in Hong Kong. It's called the Design Biennale Urbanism and Architecture. And he also worked with the creative technologists to um, tell the artisans how to, you know, what QR code to weave into the mat so that when people go, they can find stories of the artisans who made the mat um, when they put the QR code, when they scan the QR code on their phones. So they're telling the story of the artisans in Malaysian East Coast, in Malaysia East Coast, and how they make it with what materials, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in Hong Kong through an architecture biennale. And we did a ex mini exhibit in the shop as well to show people what you know uh, how craft will go beyond craft when we collaborate with uh, different parts of the creative industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.